I'm going to share my screen here. I hope all of you can see uh, my screen. So first and most importantly, a reminder that interpretation is available in English, Spanish and French. Please look for the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on that and choose your language of preference. Please, everyone, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking so that we can hear everyone clearly. And feel free to turn off your video if your connection is slow so that you can absorb as much as possible. A reminder and a request to please speak slowly today because we have interpreters and it will be a huge help to them if you all speak slowly. Live transcripts are available for this webinar and they'll show up at the bottom of your screen in just a minute. Please feel free to rename yourself uh, in your uh, in the in, in the Zoom platform. So, for instance, I've named myself my name, followed by the name of the organization and uh, where I'm joining from today, and as well as the, the language in which I will be um, participating. Today. And finally, a reminder and a request that we will be recording today's session. So if for some reason you prefer not to be uh, made visible, feel free to have your video off, feel free to change your name. If that is something that would make you make more comfortable, absolutely fine by us. Um, so yeah, if you have any tech requests, any questions, be, feel free to just put it in the chat and uh, someone from our team will help you out. All right. All right, let's get started. Welcome to this webinar on carbon removals, unraveling the real story. The title for this was indeed carefully chosen because what you are going to hear in today's webinar about removals is really not something that you will read uh, in a newspaper or watch on primetime news about, right? This story is very rarely told and is often in fact deliberately obfuscated and kept hidden by all the major players in the game. There has been little to no discussion about whether we even need removals, but things like geoengineering projects or bioenergy carbon capture and storage and monoculture tree plantations are going full steam ahead all over the world and receiving millions of dollars in funding worldwide. Are removals a distraction from the real work of cutting emissions? What do these removals projects actually look like on the ground? And what impact will they have on the land sector, particularly forests? What are the human rights implications of these projects? Right, we're gonna get into all of this and more. We would love to hear from you, everyone who's attending, who you are, where you're joining us from, what interests you about this webinar. So the chat box is open for all of you. So please feel free to speak to everyone through that, introduce yourselves. My name is Chitira Vijayakumar. I'm the communications coordinator of the Global Forest Coalition, and I'm based out of Kerala, which is in India. I'm going to quickly share my screen again so that I can show you the agenda for the day. Right. So today we have, uh, this is what we're going to be uh, doing today. Right. So we have four incredible experts who are going to speak to us today. Uh, a quick reminder to our distinguished speakers that you will each have the floor for about 12 minutes. I would remind you by a chat uh, when you have about a couple of minutes left to go. Um, Peter Riggs from Pivot Point will be speaking to us, followed by Tamara Gilbertson from the Indigenous Environmental Network, Stephen Leonard from the Land Gap Report Team, and Anita Nepdano from the ETC Group will round things up for us and close uh, the speaking section of today's webinar. We'll then open for a question and answer and a discussion section where we, hide, we would love to hear from everyone who's listening. So feel free to participate um, by either unmuting your microphone or putting your question in the chat. 
we close with a video that the GFC uh, produced last year about the real solutions to the climate change crisis. And then finally, we round it up with a whole slew of resources and articles and videos and next steps to look out for. All right. Fantastic. So. Oh, I'd love to see your message in the chat. Yeah, keep them coming. So let's let's get started with the first speaker for the day, Peter Riggs. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Peter Riggs is the director of Pivot Point and the former co-coordinator of the Climate, Land, Ambition and Rights Alliance, Clara. He will be speaking to us today about the question, is net zero another form of extractivism? Over to you, Peter. Thanks so much, Chitra. Many thanks. Um, good morning to everybody. It might be evening where you are, but it's morning uh, where I am. It's getting light now. Um, I also want to thank in advance um, Megan Morrissey and the other translators. You know, one of the hardest things to do is to thank yourself as a translator, but please do it, <laughs> translators. Thank yourself in advance because you're having to interpret around this funny word, removals. What does it mean? So removals is carbon removal from the atmosphere, removing carbon to be stored in trees or soils, but also removed and stored in geologic formations but this is the idea that somehow we can remove carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere how did we get here how did we get to the point where we're not talking about emissions reductions but instead we're talking about scaling up removals what happened to get us to this point? And now I'm gonna share my screen. I hope it works. Come on now. Okay. Great. Um, I'm beginning at the end in some ways because i'm asking a basic question can you see the screen chitra and others can you see this title is net zero a form of extractivism many of you will be familiar with this concept of extractivism it's tied to colonialism and imperialism and world economic systems extracting minerals, extracting water, cycles of extraction that deepen the logic of capitalism. And net zero is a concept that came out of the Paris Agreement. We'll talk about how we got there. But increasingly, we are worried, and we, in this case, I would say the speakers on this webinar, we are worried that net zero is becoming a new form of extractivism. Sorry, I'm trying to get, there we go. So really what this means is an attempt to put a price and to commodify different parts of nature. As you can see in here, with uh, folks putting a label on various parts of nature, wildlife, biodiversity, trees, uh, sequestration capacity. This is being turned into a market resource. But for what purpose? Well, for the purpose of corporate alignment with net zero and an attempt to 
show corporate responsibility by adopting a net zero target. But should we be comfortable with this? Should we trust these net zero targets? Where did they come from? How did we get here? I'm going to describe four areas in which removals were suggested as a solution. First and most importantly, removals were suggested as a solution by climate modelers. Why is this important? Climate modelers working under the IPCC uh, projected continued economic growth, projected continued business as usual, and at the same time, the IPCC scientists wanted to construct a set of scenarios to limit global warming to two degrees. Now, a reminder, this was more than 10 years ago. This was 15 years ago during the previous IPCC scientific cycle called the AR5. If you project continued capitalist growth, continued economic development, continued uh, consumption, there was no way that we could do all these things we could continue to expand our economy and increase our consumption. No way to do it and still stay within reasonable temperature limits. Meaning that the IPC scientists projected warming greater than two degrees. Three degrees, in fact, is what they found. More than three degrees. So how to make this work? Aha, we will introduce a new concept. It's called removals. We will look at ecosystem and geoengineering approaches to removing carbon from the atmosphere. Does that mean that immediately the IPC scientists were developing engineering ideas or calling for an end to deforestation? What were they doing about removals? This is important to realize. They were taking the removals and putting it in the climate models in order to keep warming to two degrees. That is, removals first appeared as a, um, as a concept in the models, but not in reality. But unfortunately, in that scientific setting, that provided legitimacy to the idea of removals. We then move to another concept that was introduced both by scientists as well as the UNFCCC, and that is the concept of uh, business as usual, the idea that we will continue on a growth path, but we will find ways to decarbonize some of that growth. And that is the logic that we've seen in red plus reduction in emissions from deforestation and degradation. I think Tamara and others will talk about this. Um, a third area in which removals were legitimized is through the idea of offsets. Now, offsets are a bigger concept than just carbon removal. We have seen biodiversity offsets. We have seen other types of uh, removal programs proposed that um, would allow one unit of something it could be wildlife, like in this picture, um, but it, it, you exchange one thing for another. So it creates 
this idea of fungibility or equal exchange between things that in fact aren't equal. And this was a necessary step towards carbon commodification, turning carbon into a tradable commodity. The last setting in which removals were normalized, you know, brought into the picture was in fact the Paris Agreement. Now the phrase net zero does not appear in this Paris Agreement, but it does talk about balancing emissions and removals by the year 2050. Um, we could say a lot more about the history of this, but I think other speakers will do so and my time is short. But let me just indicate where the enabling conditions for carbon commodification came from. As mentioned, the IPCC definition of removals was very helpful to this project of creating uh, a market for removals. Same with the Biocarbon Fund at the World Bank and the other climate investment funds. The Clean Development Mechanism also allowed uh, attention to removals. Red Plus National Programs also contributed to this idea that we need removals and we need to pay for removals. The voluntary carbon markets are based on this idea of removals. Paris Agreement Article 6, which we'll be talking about, also centers on removals. Corsia is the airline's plan for buying, uh, appropriating removals. This language appeared most recent in the more recent COPs, hard to abate sectors, saying, oh, well, some sectors are very difficult to decarbonize, so we'll need removals to take care of emissions from those sectors. Nature-based solutions, I think others will talk about <laughs> this as well. Um, this is a phrase, again, meant to normalize the idea of removals. And then finally, this resulted in net zero. So these are all the all the momentum to create and make normal this idea of removals. This is a list of the programs and ideas that contributed to this, which ends up in this very bizarre notion that everything should be a, uh, a carbon offset. My time is uh, very short, so let me just move quickly. Here in this picture, we are demonstrating what we see as the greenwash associated with removals. You can see the Shell Oil Company, the Total Oil Company. You can see airlines. These very high emitting sectors want to use removals from nature-based solutions to allow and excuse ongoing emissions in those sectors. So we see red credits, we see nature-based solutions, we see tech companies wanting to sign up to plant trees, again, to increase removals. But what does this mean at a global level? Well, much of the offsetting, much of the use of removals we see are located in the global south, but uh, intended to benefit the rich countries in the global north. So here too, around removals, we are seeing a net flow of benefits to the global north. So here's where we are. We've inherited a system of market-based solutions that are pretending to be nature based solutions. No problem with genuine community-based nature solutions, but we reject the elements of nature-based solutions which have found their way into the IPCC and UNFCCC texts. Biodiversity offsets, carbon offsets, plantation forestry, biomass burning, monoculture plantations. It is up to all of us, men and women, to work to separate this idea of removals from the carbon market and return the question of ecosystem integrity and social resilience to the center of our discussion. 
Global Forest Coalition actually summarized the challenge beautifully in their slogan, your, our nature is not your solution. That is, we will not be selling our nature in order to allow you to claim a false solution. So this is the struggle we face. I look forward to contributions from other speakers who will go into more depth on these topics. And I look forward to the question and answers. Thank you, Chitra, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Uh, I really, really loved your choice of wording in emphasizing the normalization of carbon removals uh, because, you know, and for taking us through how we were conditioned to think that responding to climate change can be reduced to a mathematical equation almost, right? One carbon in, one carbon out, right? And thank you for making the absurdity of that really obvious and really simple and really clear. Of course, we'll hear more from you uh, during the Q&A and discussion, of course. But for now, we're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Tamara Gilbertson. Uh, Dr. Tamara is the Climate Justice Project Coordinator of the Indigenous Environmental Network. She's a lecturer of political economy and environmental sociology in the Department of Sociology at the University of Tennessee and in the Environmental Policy and Sustainability Management Program at the New School in New York. She is a fellow at the Center for the Study of Social Justice and author of many articles and publications. Over to you, Dr. Tamara. Thank you so much, Chitira, and um, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Global Forest Coalition for inviting me to speak at this webinar. Um, I'm very grateful to everyone and very honored to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pick up a little bit where Peter left off um, and, um, and, and go into a little bit more depth um, as well. So thank you so much as well, Peter, for that overview. And we'll start here. So let's let's look at how a little bit of not is it only, it's not only removals, as Peter pointed out, but actually an, an entire structure that's been set up over the last 20, 25 years um, that continues to ignore the fact that we desperately need to reduce emissions at source. Um, as soon as possible and phase out emissions. I wanna start a little bit talking about article six today of the Paris Agreement. Um, we'll explain a little bit about carbon dioxide removals. We'll talk about both the biological removals and the engineered removals. And then I wanna talk a little bit about, um, about the, the submissions process that's been going on um, and some outcomes from Bonn at the last supervisory body meeting as well. So after 20 years of pricing pollution and carbon pricing systems, we have 68 carbon pricing instruments in operation in the world. Um, the, the demand for carbon credits continues to increase, as Peter pointed out, in response to these net zero emissions reductions commitments that we're seeing very much coming from the private sector. These increased um, and, and started to dominate the carbon pricing uh, and carbon markets uh, systems around 2019, where we saw a shift from in the carbon markets um, that was where the voluntary markets started to supersede the compliance markets. And this was partially due to the delay in the Paris Agreement um, setting up Article 6, which is the big global carbon markets trading system. Um, so we started to see in 20, by 2021, higher carbon prices, big revenues from different carbon instruments um, and an increase um, in trading systems resulting in record highs and global carbon pricing revenue um, that, that we'd never seen, that we have never seen before um, in the markets. This is just a snapshot from the World Bank of the different carbon pricing instruments in the world. Um, and you can see how these um, have been are, are being implemented, are being slated to be implemented. And a lot of this is in response um, to the Paris Agreement being finalized in terms of it, Article 6 being brought online. Of course, that's not happening immediately, but this is under discussion. And also the reason that we're sitting here today together on this webinar is to discuss what are some of the elements in that discussion. 
Over the last 20 years or so, we've really been in a language war. And I know that Neth um, and others um, at ETC group point this out as well, that we've gone from something where what in the market-based trading system started out as what were called flexible mechanisms in the 90s to cap and trade systems that exist today, to carbon pricing instruments, to emissions trading systems. And the ETS was, is something that's been used since the beginning as well. Um, and agriculture, what we, what we talked about as agri-fuels in the early 2000s are now being seen as soil offsets, also something that's now being brought into the biological removals arena, um, um, now called, you know, looked at as climate smart agriculture. And that's a whole other conversation. Um, forests, which were once called carbon sinks, now is forest offsets. The red program brought online because we pushed back so hard in the 90s on that. That was brought online in 2007, 2008, and now sort of um, nature-based solutions includes the soils and land-based offsets all together. Um, you know, and we we start we continue to see language around carbon negative or carbon zero and these different languages used for carbon capture and storage, also net zero emissions sort of housing all of these things and now a push for carbon dioxide removals and then more shifts in carbon finance as well, which I'm not going to talk about today. Article six of the Paris Agreement is the carbon markets system within the Paris Agreement. And I'll just talk a little bit about Article Two first, which is basically uh, being set up so that emissions trading systems that are compliance markets that, that are um, you know, overseen by states and governments um, can then sort of be linked together in a common database. Um, and, and this is being discussed now. Um, there is every intention to link 6.2 to 6.4, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and, and these can be national and bilateral carbon credit-based systems that would then be sort of overseen within 6.2. Within 6.2 as well is what's called cooperative approaches. Um, and this is basically where countries um, will aim to meet their nationally determined contributions or their level of reductions of emission emissions through buying and selling and trading what are called ITMOs or ITMOs, internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, which essentially function like offsets. So this Article 6.2 will, will be a database where countries can say, well, uh, we've met our nationally determined contributions and we can uh, put our ITMOs up into this, this uh, database system for other countries to buy to meet their nationally determined contributions. Or um, the opposite could be true, where a country may not be able to meet its NDCs and can buy and purchase an ITMO on this database. A lot of the questions here um, is about uh, how to track the ITMOs in an international global system and also track that through em existing emissions trading systems. So will the ITMO have a unique number or does that number then um, uh, cease to exist once it is then traded in the system? Um, will this, will these, will countries then trade it on and, be, and will it become a fraudulent type system where there's double counting and how will that be tracked? Who will track it inside of such an immense system? We're also not sure what ITMOs can be. Will they be biofuels? Will it be climate smart agriculture, um, CCS or other types of false solutions? There may be common um, uh, problems that we've seen in other ETS systems going forward. In 6.4, Article 6, Paragraph 4 of the Paris Agreement, this was once referred to as a sustainable development mechanism that would that will take place of the clean development mechanism, which is still true, but it's now being called more than mechanisms database. And Bonn, we heard a lot about this. Many of us sat in on the pre-meetings of the supervisory body. Um, but just briefly, what is Article 6.4? So again, this will be the, the grand uh, type of 
um, emissions uh, offsets or carbon credit systems system that will take place of the clean development mechanism. Um, this will be bilateral, but also overseen by the UNFCCC. 4% of the trading will go to the adaptation fund, which also creates a dependency model so that the adaptation fund and possibly other funds are then dependent on these trades. And, um, you know, and this is problematic in, the, in terms of what happens when, uh, if, if the, the, the markets fail um, and, and many other questions we have. Um, but the, the supervisory body is now reviewing different types of carbon dioxide removals and how they will then be linked or, or brought into and be used um, as offsets in this system. Um, another uh, thing that we're seeing or an issue that we're seeing is how 6.4 and 6.2 um, will be linked in the system. Of course, the U.S. Uh, doesn't want it to be called linking. We saw this at Bonn where the U.S. you know, sort of stood up the last two days and said, we can't use the word linking. We think that's because perhaps um, 6.2 would have to be agreed upon by Congress and they don't want that. Um, but of course they want uh, corporations and, and other entities to be able to buy and sell and trade through 6.4. This directly involves the private sector um, as well, including airlines, Amazon, um, and others that will be able to uh, buy and sell and trade. So carbon dioxide removals includes these different forms. The biological CDR, which includes nature-based solutions, land-based offsets, forest offsets, soil offsets, and also and increasingly discussions around ocean offsets. On the other side, we have engineered CDR, which include carbon capture and storage, which is 96% of that is enhanced oil recovery, or which is nothing new. Um, BECs are bioenergy and carbon capture and storage, direct air capture and carbon capture use and storage, which is manufacturing um, and, and things like putting CO2 and, and cement and other types of manufacturing. And then we have other types of um, ocean dumping fertilization, which, would, which, inc which is linked to bio, biological CDR um, and other types of geoengineering like uh, solar radiation management, cloud breaking. Um, but for now, I wanna just go over a few of the biological CDR um, forms. And what we've seen over the last 15, 20 years um, with, sorry, with biological removals is a divide and conquer colonialist strategy um, for, for for projects like RED or reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, we rarely, if ever, see FPIC or free prior informed consent used um, when, when the carbon brokers and the carbon managers come to indigenous people's territories. Um, we see them use dirty tricks that undermine tribal constitutions to get tribal um, leaders to sign on to these programs and projects without the membership fully informed. Um, this, these are acts that are deliberately used often against tribal membership. And many of my colleagues can speak to this. Um, we've seen insiders bribe, um, bribe certain leaders and different groups. And we continue to see the greenwash um, uh, that's used in order to get uh, tribal communities to sign up to this. I think it's really important to note that these are different carbon cycles when we talk about biological removals. The carbon cycle um, that is underneath the earth and in, in the form of fossil fuels is not impacting the emission, the, the atmosphere, the, the, the biosphere overground. But when it's brought out and extracted and combusted and burnt, this is why we have climate change. We know this to be true. So there's no amount of removals that can happen on the biological spaces like forests and soils and oceans because the atmosphere is saturated um, the, already with carbon. And the time frame that it would take for, for, the, for, for the earth to then draw that down 
is thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, but, but there's also other chemicals that are that are brought out into the biosphere that we're dealing with. And, and also these feedback effects that we have. So biological removals can't function because we don't, we've already saturated the earth and the time frame of, of absorbing that carbon and locking it back in to the biological systems um, is, is far beyond what is possible. And we've run out of time. And, and so we see these, these massive extraction spaces um, that also are, Hi, are continuing. Yeah, are we finishing? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, but could you begin to wrap up in the next minute or so? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. So I'll just I'll just move on to that. There's a push for soil and ag offsets. We're, this will be a huge issue at COP28 moving towards Dubai. Um, I want to also point out a few points on engineered CDR. The capture, carbon capture and storage uh, the majority of it, 96%, is enhanced oil recovery. This is also nothing new. Um, we've, we see that the majority of this has already been used. There is a massive build out in the United States right now for carbon capture and storage. It's also expanding um, and, and, and moving across um, different types of, uh, across the, the, the globe. Um, in the US itself, we see this, this coming out right now at, through a huge um, pipeline, a CO2 pipeline uh, linking up hubs. You can see up here in the Midwest, the yellow ones represent linking up methane hubs, um, a huge link out in the Southeast as well, or the, the, in the, the South and in California. Um, we're fighting this in the US. Many communities, BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities are impacted. This is an, an environmental justice issue. It's a climate justice issue. We're fighting this um, and we continue to fight this. And we're concerned of how this link, this, this build out for CO2 pipelines and, and CO2 um, for CCS is going to be used for the United States um, MDCs. Uh, we're very concerned about that and how carbon capture continues uh, as it's as it's being expanded, how there are tax reliefs and, and other forms. I want to also just point out a few issues around domestic carbon pricing. We're seeing this in the agriculture agriculture sectors right now. Um, monies that are coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act and the IRA to prop up CCS. Um, we have huge campaigns that we're building now. We need all kinds of support. And we're very concerned about how this is being used as a pilot in the US to then ex expand this around the world. Um, finally, my last point is about the submissions process and the supervisory body. Um, they continue to say that they want engagement, um, but but they they've created this question this questionnaire that was incredibly biased, assuming that CCS and other types of removals would be just automatically included. Um, we're very concerned about how 6.4 and 6.2 are going to be combined um, between the mechanisms database and the 6.2 cooperative approaches and to meeting NDCs. There are finance questions, carbon finance questions that are not being met. We are pushing for a grievance mechanism in 6.4 so that communities that have been duped into these different systems can have a way to, to come out of and, and be released from different um, types of uh, um, contracts that, that force them to continue to use this. And finally, um, I, I just wanna say how Red Plus is now being propped up as a model um, in these spaces. And, um, and that 6.4 and 6.2 are still under, the, the good news here is that they're still far away from being adopted and finalized. We're gonna be kicking butt on this in the next year or you know into next year. But I also wanna point out how 6.8, which is called a non-market mechanism, that that database is being basically slated to be um, uh, put online in Dubai at the next COP. And has all, there is also talk about how that will be linked to 6.4. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank you very much. 
gosh, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you during the question answer um, session. Uh, because what your brilliant PowerPoint makes really clear is that carbon removals is market led. There is no question about it. And it also, by way of design, undermines the sovereignty and cohesion of indigenous and local communities. Uh, thanks also for pointing out what we should be watching out for at COP28 and beyond about this insidious uh, subject. All right. Thank you so much again. And we're going to move on to the third speaker for today, uh, Stephen Leonard. Stephen is an international lawyer specializing in climate change, human rights, and biodiversity. He is the president of the Climate Justice Program uh, in Australia and has a long history of work on climate litigation, supporting indigenous movements and right based approaches and strategy development, research, writing, and advocacy. Um, he has also established a new global international law and policy group, the RA Group, which is providing strategic support to a range of organizations, including civil society, foundations, UN agencies, and the government. So over to you, Stephen. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chitira. Um, I, I note the, 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 the multiple references to speaking slowly, so I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'm usually um, a bit guilty of, uh, of speaking a bit too quick and interpreters um, tick me off uh, quite regularly. But uh, yeah, also following up on Peter's good example, I think in terms of um, expressing gratitude to, to interpreters, um, uh, not, not done enough. So thanks Peter for, for mentioning that. And also um, thanks to, uh, to the Global Forest Coalition for inviting me along um, to speak. I've spoken at uh, a previous uh, similar type of event and, um, and it's, good to, it's good to be invited back and to, to speak again. Um, so I'll be speaking just uh, very briefly. I've been asked to, to talk about the, um, the implications um, of, of removals. And, uh, and you know, I mean, I think this is something that comes up um, throughout everybody's presentation. So I'll, I'll be touching briefly on the implications of removals um, in terms of, I guess, the, the types of risks that, uh, or some of the, the key risks that, uh, that come up, but also putting it into context as a result of some work um, that, uh, that, that we had done. Um, Peter was also involved in that. It was some research that was led by uh, Dr. Kate Dooley, who um, many of you may know, who's, um, who's now based at, at Melbourne University. And this was, uh, this was a report that came out um, towards the towards the end of last year, just before um, COP27, which was called the Land Gap um, Report, and I'm, I'm also going to focus a bit on, um, on on things that we can do, you know, so so sort of next steps and immediate steps and things that we may um, be able to do as a, as a as a community of concerned people, activists, uh, etc., um, uh, dealing with this, this this is an issue. So maybe we can just move on to the next slide. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a Zoom issue, so I'm having to ask for my slides to be shared there. So, but in terms of the um, implications of removals, um, I mean, you know, the work that we did on the land gap came about as a result of an extremely heavy reliance on removals identified in, um, in NDCs. And so, uh, for those who may not know, NDC is a, a country um, a sort of, you know, contributions, nationally determined contributions that are, are put on by countries um, as a part of the uh, UN um, climate policy process. Um, and in terms of the implications of, of removals themselves, it's, it's something very broad and, and, and to, a, to a large extent, it depends on, on the type of removals. And so... Um, what we are seeing, and, and this has been mentioned um, by both Peter and, and Tamara, um, is these categorizations, and um, here we go, <laughs> already being um, told off by the uh, interpreters. Um, but we uh, we are seeing these uh, these these categorizations of of removals and and efforts at the moment to be uh, defining um, removals in in the, in the IPCC AR6 report. There are three um, different attempts at, at defining. Uh, removals and the uh, Article 6.4 supervisory body um, seems to be also doing work to try um, to find uh, a definition. Um, I, I do note that, uh, and I'd be interested in what uh, Tamara or others uh, that are following the uh, 6.4 supervisory body work closely would say, it seems to me the documentation um, is becoming uh, a bit less uh, um, of, of em emphasis on, on, on definitions. The first draft um, seems to be very heavy on, 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 on defining, but I'm not sure whether or not um, this is sort of beginning to, to, to change, but that'd be interesting to explore. But 
Um, it also seems that there's uh, somewhat of a limited approach, um, very much revolving around um, CCS uh, technologies and, of course, um, bioenergy and carbon capture and storage, which, um, which is something that, uh, that, that is. So it seems that these sort of carbon capture and storage approaches are, are, are really um, where a lot of the focus is. But obviously, there's a lot of, um, a lot of other approaches to, to removals that are, that are being um, discussed. But uh, essentially, two categorizations that we have heard, so biological um, removals and, uh, and geochemical um, uh, geoengineering, I guess, may fall within um, the, uh, the uh, hang on, that's an interesting um, response uh, there. Um, geochemical and geoengineering um, uh, may fall within the context of, uh, of geochemical um, removals. And uh, in the context of biological uh, removals, we have uh, land-based uh, removals. And, and as Tamara also mentioned, ocean um, based removals are, are becoming um, you know, more, more of an emphasis there. Um, and uh, when it comes to ocean based removals, I think the, I guess the, the progression from um, red plus that, uh, that we have seen is moving very much in the direction of blue carbon. Um, and so we can probably um, expect a lot more um, similar type of work to, to what we saw with red plus in, in, in that blue carbon um, space. Um, and then we also need to consider the storage aspect of it when we're thinking about the the implications but maybe we can move on to the uh to the next uh, the next slide um so the um the land gap work that was undertaken um just to put it into context a little bit and i won't uh, i won't spend too long on this slide but um we assessed uh, all of the ndcs and um and, and had a look at uh, all of the different targets um, and the different strategies. And if there was no um, sort of adequate information in NDCs, there were some um, unofficial sources that were used. And we had a look across um, seven different uh, categorizations. And, um, and, and so, um, as I mentioned, this work was led by um, scientists um, and uh, Peter and I, um, Peter's also on this call, um, was supporting in terms of, uh, I guess, sort of coordination type work, but we also went through some consultations with uh, civil society and indigenous groups um, and had uh, scientists who were working um, on, on this um, across uh, ag agroforestry, um, agri ag agriculture, indigenous peoples representatives who were involved in the work. Um, specialists, uh, legal specialists on rights, um, specialists on, uh, on, on biodiversity and, um, and natural forests. And, uh, and so we had a good mix of, of scientists um, working across this report. Um, and maybe we can just move on to the next slide, which is the, um, some key messages that uh, came from the report. Um, so what we found essentially from having a look at uh, the reliance on, um, on, on, on removals in NDCs um, was that uh, countries' climate pledges rely on an unrealistic uh, amount of land. So essentially what this uh, finding um, was that there's, uh, that there's more land required um, for removals in the current NDCs than what is actually available. Um, and so this then re results in um, you know, a very significant amount of pressure um, in addition to the existing pressures um, that, uh, that we're, we're seeing on land. Um, some of those pressures from the, um, I guess, the uh, traditional um, or, or what the issues have been around for quite some time, for example, you know, palm oil or um, soy. Um, but uh, when we think about the pressure coming in from removals, it also needs to be considered in the context of other um, approaches to addressing climate change, uh, for example, nickel mining um, for uh, electric vehicle batteries. And so, um, so what we are seeing is you know, um, a, a very, very, very um, significant increase in terms of uh, additional pressure um, on, uh, on the land sector. Um, more than half of the um, total area that was, that's been pledged for carbon removals involves um, reforestation or, or restoration and um, a very significant amount of that um, restoration um, uh, or, or reforestation efforts is, uh, is actually turning out to be um, plantations. Um, and, and so a lot of these um, plantations uh, are being put in place for 
um, you know, bioenergy um, and, and other um, continued efforts and being sort of justified um, as being uh, restoration. Um, net accounting assumptions also um, assume that uh, planting new trees offset emissions from fossil fuels. Um, here, this uh, point on fungibility that was mentioned by Peter um, is, uh, is problematic and also um, un unrealistic. Um, the land rights challenge is uh, also um, a major concern um, because a lot of the, uh, the areas that are being, um, I guess, targeted um, for removals activities are on areas where um, Indigenous communities uh, are claiming um, territories. And as we, uh, as we know, um, the, uh, the, the uptake um, on the part of governments to recognition um, of uh, Indigenous people's rights has been very slow. Um, and then in terms of uh, agroecology, you know, this is, uh, I guess, more of a solutions oriented um, uh, point here in terms of the, the benefits that can come from, from, from agroecological uh, approaches. If we can just move on to the next slide, please. Um, and again, just more on, um, more on the, the results. So in total, uh, essentially 1.2 billion um, hectares, uh, and this is like larger than the entire uh, USA. So this is, this is what is essentially, um, uh, this is what it all adds up to in, in terms of uh, what countries are saying. Um, are going to be needed for uh, for, for for removals. Um, so maybe we can just move on to the to the next one. Um, so just in terms of some of the impacts here, um, I mean we often we talk about the issues associated with uh, with rights and um, and and continued uh, deforestation, but but this uh, this issue around um, delaying reductions of emissions, um, you know, this is uh, this is a very a very serious issue um, because you know, essentially, and I think uh, Tamara made the point about not really having time available anymore. Um, and so, when we're in a situation of delay, um, you know, we really are starting to um, head over the head over the, the threshold or go over the cliff um, on things. And so, um, you know, removals does really create this distraction. It does create this. Um, I guess uh, justification and greenwashing that we see coming um, out from the fossil fuel industry and um, and other other polluting uh, industries, you know, fashion industry, um, even the renewables um, industry. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of greenwash that uh, that comes out. Um, again, I'd go back to nickel and um, electric vehicle batteries. There's uh, you know, greenwash isn't something that is uh, is is just limited to to the fossil fuel industry, for example. Um, but this uh, net in in net zero essentially is is creating a, a sort of a get out of jail free card for the fossil fuel industry. Um, and uh, and this is something that uh, that I think we, we we should be working quite hard to. Um, to, uh, to, um, to, to, to avoid um, ongoing violation of rights of Indigenous peoples um, and local communities, especially women, is another um, major concern that comes up um, and uh, potential for land grabs um, associated with uh, restoration and removals uh, activities, as is going back to the amount of land that uh, is going to be required. Um, you can imagine the, uh, the sorts of sort of corporate um, dealings that may go on between uh, companies and governments um, in terms of uh, getting hold of the land um, that uh, that would be needed, um, and uh, where Indigenous uh, women, for example, are already um, extremely vulnerable to uh, to climate change. Um, this is uh, this is increases that that, that vulnerability, um, and this uh, increasing pressure on on land and potential for conversion. Uh, to, to, to plantations um, in the process here also um, continues to put pressure on um, forests and biodiversity in circumstances where uh, the, the, the highest mitigation benefit based on the science that's out there, the highest uh, mitigation benefit in terms of uh, forest is, is essentially to be protecting uh, the, uh, the natural forests that, uh, that, that, that are in place. Um, so if we can move on to the, uh, to the next slide. So here I just have a couple of um, recommendations, I suppose, in terms of um, different uh, policy um, points that could be raised. And so um, the first is to be, I guess, advocating around um, the pre protection of existing natural forests and recognition of Indigenous people's rights, which I'm sure that uh, we're all probably already doing in, in different ways. 
promoting agroecology. Um, and so here, of course, you know, we have different spaces where agriculture is a major discussion. And so sort of, you know, working towards pushing um, things away from that uh, sort of climate smart agriculture tech um, sort of approach innovations, big, uh, big, big ag sort of approaches that are coming in and again, getting more of an emphasis there on, on agroecology. Um, the global stock take is uh, happening in the UNFCCC. And so um, here it would be good to see whether or not we can get some of the findings from the land gap report recognized um, within, the, uh, within the global stock take space um, here. And so um, it'd be nice if, uh, if, if the global stock take was able to look at, um, at uh, addressing social and environmental um, constraints around the uh, feasibility of land-based uh, carbon removals that are currently in um, NDCs and also encouraging countries to be reducing um, their reliance on, on, on land-based uh, removals. And so if this was something that was possible to um, advocate around um, when it comes to the GST and then to the last slide with just a couple more um, recommendations there. Um, so we also have the, the, the biennial transparency um, reporting coming up, and so here, and one of the one of the challenges that we had with the work um, was uh, the extent of information that was available, and so looking at how to be increasing transparency and having more information around removals in uh, in, in the reporting processes within the UNFCCC, as well as in the um, the next round of nationally determined um, contributions. And then, uh, as Tamara mentioned, there are these processes that are ongoing um, under the supervisory body um, uh, concerning Article 6 at the moment. This submissions process, I think it's open um, for the next week or two. I think it's only it's a very short process. So again, um, the bias seems to be coming through. You know, these short submissions processes make it very difficult um, for, uh, for participation and coordination amongst networks. And, um, this one, I believe, is only 14 days. Uh, and then there'll be some recommendations that will come out in, in August, I, I believe. And so um, here between uh, August and, and when um, people get to the COP in November, December, um, there's an opportunity, I guess, there to be looking at the recommendations and, um, and, uh, and, and determining uh, sort of positions around that for, for advocacy purposes. So there are a few um, immediate ways to engage in some of these processes where removals are under discussion. Um, and with that, I will uh, finish and uh, look forward to the rest of the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for that comprehensive take on how and why exactly carbon removals is a wildly unrealistic and unworkable idea, um, and uh, as well as for pointing uh, to, to the way forward. Right. Uh, looking forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A, of course. And we already have a few questions coming uh, in the chat. I invite everyone listening to go ahead and ask, uh, ask your questions in the chat box, and then we'll get to them uh, at the end of this, uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so please go ahead and ask your questions. We love, we love to have this rich discussion going side by side. And finally, we're going to move on to the last speaker for the day, uh, Elenita Netz Dano. Elenita is Asia Director and Coordinator of the Action Group on Erosion, Technology and Concentration, the ETC group, which was mentioned several times uh, in today's webinar, of course, which is based in Southern Philippines. The ETC group is an international civil society organization that monitors the impacts of new and emerging technologies on marginalized communities, tracks corporate concentration and governance in food and agriculture, and also investigates erosion of biodiversity. Over to you, Elevator. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I will um, flash my slides. Um, I was actually asked to uh, focus my presentation on land-based removals, um, specifically um, geoengineering techniques that are figuring out in the discussion on removals um, around Article 6.4. And I think with the brilliant presentations that preceded mine, um, I will try not to repeat what's been said by colleagues, um, like-minded colleagues, uh, by the way. And I'll just uh, focus on, on this um, technologies that are figuring out uh, prominently um, in discussions on um, removals um, in recent uh, months. 
So I'll focus on geoengineering, as I mentioned. Um, I think all three um, colleagues referred to geoengineering because of how they have figured in the discussions on Article 6.4, um, subsidiary bodies, um, supervisory bodies meetings um, recently. And I'm sure most of us um, who are in this list, um, who are in this webinar, actually have some background on geoengineering, but just to refresh that um, geoengineering refers to a set of technologies um, to intentionally um, intervene in and alter earth systems on a mega scale. Um, I'd like to emphasize here technologies because this is really about a techno fix, um, uh, clear and simple. And also the intentional or deliberate um, aspect is very um, explicit as well. And also the fact that it has to be large scale or mega scale to make any difference um, in addressing global warming. And the aim is particularly to manipulate the climate to counteract some of the effects of climate change. Like if you will look um, into references on geoengineering, most of them would actually um, refer to the two categories of geoengineering, largely carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management. But since um, 2018, um, there's actually a deliberate move to separate carbon dioxide removal or CDR from that whole term geoengineering, which uh, us in civil society are resisting because this is really a politically motivated um, attempt um, to separate carbon dioxide removal from the more controversial elements um, in geoengineering um, and just um, refer to geoengineering as um, largely around solar radiation management. I will not go into SRM, but this is equally um, controversial, perhaps even more so um, since none, none of the existing UN processes or convention actually covered um, SRM, except perhaps um, the, con the Convention on Biodiversity, which has an existing um, moratorium on geoengineering as a whole. And we also heard from various sources that there are attempts not to bring the whole discussion of solar radiation management or um, they call it um, solar engineering um, in some um, spaces that it this will, this will be discussed, um, the governance of SRM will be discussed in the UN General Assembly in the upcoming um, session, but that's for another webinar. I'll focus on CDR, carbon dioxide removal, which uh, um, is deliberately not being labeled as geoengineering, but um, it all fits in. Um, the, the whole definition of geoengineering, it's technological based, technology based, it's intentional um, or deliberate intervention, and also, in order to make a difference in the climate, it has to be in a mega scale, not even large scale, but mega scale. So geoengineering, as mentioned by colleagues, have actually um, surfaced in the discussions on Article 6.4, um, the, the, the series of discussions that are ongoing um, by the supervisory body on Article 6.4. Um, geoengineering, in particular, carbon dioxide removal techniques, are currently being considered as engineering-based removals. And I think um, um, Steve has actually um, discussed this, the evolution of that discussion, whether that's going to be um, biological based or, or some other labels will have to be created because um, some of these techniques actually struggle, struggle between uh, being biological and engineering based. Um, some of the land-based um, techniques that are mentioned in the evolution of the discussions in Article 6.4 um, are BEX or bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, and also direct air capture. I will focus my presentation on marine-based um, carbon dioxide removal techniques, namely enhanced weathering, um, ocean alkaline, alkalinization, and ocean fertilization, just to concretize these discussions on removals and what it means and what it means on um, livelihoods, on rights of communities, as well as on, on the environment and biodiversity. First, enhanced weathering. It's very technical, but it actually refers to a set of theoretical proposals. We say theoretical because there's very little to show that it works in real um, open um, environment. So it's theoretical, most of those proposals, um, and largely involving removing carbon dioxide 
by spreading large quantities of selected and finely ground rock materials or minerals into extensive land areas, beaches, or the sea surface. So enhanced weathering could actually be done in the, on land and also in marine envir environment. Um, in in this in whatever case, whether it's it's terrestrial or marine, they, that would involve um, the dispersal um, and often um, um, crushing and mining of minerals that will be ground um, that will be um, distributed or or spread out um, in extensive areas of land or 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 the seas. And the aim is to mimic and accelerate the natural weathering process of silicon or silicate or carbonate rocks, which is a slow carbonation process involving a slow carbonation process that is estimated to consume and absorb about 1 billion tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year. This is actually um, um, estimation from um, scientific studies. In marine environment, um, enhanced weathering is also referred to as ocean alkalinity enhancement or OAE. Again, additional um, additional um, acronyms um, in that long glossary of, of, of acronyms that are mentioned in this webinar. I, I saw uh, one comment about that. I think GFC will help us uh, put together that glossary. And ocean alkalinity enhancement or AE um, largely involves adding ground minerals directly to the ocean or dumping them on beaches where the wave action will actually disperse them into the water um, to theoretically, theoretically, I have to emphasize that, increase alkalinity and therefore the uptake of carbon dioxide. Um, the acceleration of the weathering process would actually involve um, mining and crushing large amounts of suitable rocks, which could be silicate or, or olivine to increase the amount of weathering rocks as well as their reactive surface. Um, what are the, the implications, no, concretely? Of course, um, since um, it will involve minerals um, that will have to be sourced out from another location and also to be mined or extracted from another location that would involve massive use of energy and water consumption. Like studies upon studies have already um, shown this, like even this um, highly touted um, a pilot being done now in Iceland, which is um, using um, um, some already crushed uh, minerals that so that would not involve um, crushing, but would still involve mining, transporting, and dispersing, actually have to show you know, um, the, the consumption of energy and water um, involved in such processes. And of course, we all know, we don't have to repeat uh, what, what colleagues have said, um, the associated, associated impacts on the environment and community rights and livelihoods, particularly of extraction or mining of minerals that will be involved um, in enhanced weathering or um, 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 alkalinity um, enhancement um, in marine environment. And um, studies also show that the effects of this um, technologies, of these techniques on biochemical processes or the marine food chains are largely unknown because these are largely theoretical, um, theoretical technologies. Um, the other um, technique, um, geoengineering technique in the marine environment that I'd like to focus on is ocean fertilization. This one is also largely theoretical, uh, but there are already um, some small scale. Small scale in ocean means, could, could mean hundreds or even thousands of square kilometers, uh, by the way. Um, so it involves um, theoretical removal of carbon dioxide, um, involving the dumping of large amounts of micro or micronutrients into marine environments um, that are identified with low biological product productivity. Um, aim to stimulate the growth of phytoplanktons. Uh, micro or micronutrients could invo involve iron particles or urea particles, which are largely used as fertilizers um, in terrestrial environment. And the whole idea is actually based on the assumption that the growth of new of, of phytoplankton will absorb atmospheric carbon dioxide and um, the, the phytoplankton when they die will actually store carbon um, on ocean floor. So that's the theoretical uh, basis of this um, technology. And compared to enhanced weathering, uh, which is 
almost primarily um, theoretical. Much of the ocean fertilization techniques that have been tried out there have actually proven to be big failures. Um, so there were experiments um, even here um, in the Philippines in the south um, sometime in 2007 and 2008 that was initiated by a group of RUG um, scientists um, based in Australia who actually um, um, dumped urea, uh, urea minerals or urea, uh, urea particles in, the, in, the, in one part of the Sulu Sea in order to uh, promote the growth of phytoplankton. And that particular experiment actually explicitly said in its proposal that they aim to earn um, carbon credits uh, from the deployment of ocean fertilization. They call it ocean nourishment um, in that case. There's also a big um, experiment um, in 2014, uh, no, 2011, um, off the waters of Vancouver in Canada, which actually involved another rude scientist um, uh, entrepreneur who actually conned a group of indigenous peoples, the, the Haiga um, communities um, in that area into believing that they could earn um, from carbon credits that will um, result from um, that ocean fertilization experiment. So explicitly, um, the ocean, most of the ocean fertilization experiments that have been tried in the real environment um, over the past 20 years were actually tied up to this whole delusion about um, carbon market and selling um, carbon credits from, from this engineering-based technology in the carbon market. So what are the potential impacts? And I think of all that the geoengineering technologies that have been uh, promoted massively um, in the past 20 years, it's actually ocean fertilization that has acquired um, um, a lot of negative um, image because of not just the RUG experiments that I mentioned, but also tons of scientific studies showing the changes in phytoplankton community will have unknown, unpredictable, and potentially highly damaging impacts on the food web in marine ecosystems. Also, Hi, it's been proven. Yes, I'm about to, to oh, yes, wrap thank up. You. Yes, that phytoplankton blooms will also reduce oxygen levels and impacting marine um, organisms, which could lead to eutrophication or, or harmful toxin-producing algae. So a lot of this um, actually um, have been shown in strings of, of, of scientific studies. And I have to mention, this is very important because this was barely, barely considered in the discussion of the uh, supervisory body on 6.4, that there are actually outstanding moratorium in the UN on ocean fertilization in particular um, in the Convention on Biodiversity, which has adopted in 2008, also in the London Convention, London Protocol on Marine Dumping, dumping from 2008 until to 2013. So I think this is a very important um, point that needs to be brought into that discussion. Largely, uh, uh, lastly, um, I have to, to um, just to highlight about uh, breaking or shattering the illusions that geoengineering will ad address the climate crisis. No, it won't. None of these techniques address the root causes of climate change. They may partially counteract some of its symptoms, but not the root causes. It doesn't actually um, lessen the dependence on fossil fuel, nor will it actually undermine continuous dependence on, on, high, on um, fossil fuels. The underlying drivers of climate change would continue unaffected. And we all know that without addressing the root causes, climate change will continue to worsen. So thanks for the opportunity to present in this webinar. Thank you so much, uh, Neth, um, and for breaking down the science behind some of these removal techniques, the theoretical um, science, of course, behind some of these techniques in a way that was really simple to understand and also really uh, gives us a sense of how dangerous the impacts can be. That was incredibly valuable. Um, we're going to now move to the question answer session, but I just want to quickly point out that um, Corina is sharing. Uh, some resources in the chat, like for instance, a slide deck, which contains links to many resources, including the land gap report and many other reports that were mentioned here today. 
that all of these resources are going to be shared in the chat and they will be shared with you in a follow-up email after this webinar is over. So please keep an eye out for these and for the follow-up uh, email as well. Uh, some great material there. So let's move on now to the question and answer session. Uh, we've already received some questions in the chat and some uh, of our panelists have been kind enough to respond by chat as well. Um, but I'm gonna start with one of the questions, uh, actually one of the requests that we got first, which was, is there any chance that you could send out a list of all the acronyms and what they stand for after the webinar? They may feel a bit overwhelming for us that are new to this field. Uh, absolutely, that's a brilliant, brilliant idea, and that's something that we're happy to work on. Um, and I think from what I understand from speaking to many of the experts in our organization as well, they can they are overwhelming even, uh, even to those who have been working in this field for a long time. So please feel, uh, please, uh, you know, it, it is not an easy topic to um, understand, which is why this uh, webinar was conceptualized to really give an introduction like a, uh, to people who might not be absolutely new to it. So yeah, we're happy to send, send out a glossary of sorts. Um, another question we received was, is there something the presenters propose to do differently? What are the suggestions? Now, I know some people responded in the chat, but would anybody like to respond um, over like about just speaking. Uh, Peter, would you like to go? I'm sorry. This this was this the question from Victor or from another another question? I'd I'd have to scroll back to see who asked the question. But what are the alternatives? We've pointed out some of the uh, issues with this. So what yeah. are the alternatives that we propose? Yeah. Um, excellent. Um, well, there's a couple of alternatives um, that we should be looking at. Um, one is um, to communicate to policymakers that it is the idea of a balance between emissions and removals. It's just a crazy idea because uh, the removals capacity of the biosphere is very limited compared to the amount of fossil emissions that are put out. I might um, I might share a graphic here, but I have to find it first um, to give a give a picture of what that looks like. Um, so, as Tamara also said in the chat, um, we need to focus on emission reductions. Having said that, there are some counter narratives to the removals discussion. One is found in Article Six Point Eight, the non market mechanism, where a number of us are working very hard to uh promote land-based uh solutions that do not involve markets but rather are based on the solidarity economy um are based on uh local capacities um to manage and secure resources that's one um victor noted in the chat and i think victor is acting asking a very important question is well can corporations do something different? And yes, they can work to decarbonize their supply chains. They can work on what's called, you know, stage three emissions. Um, there's lots to be there's lots to be done in this area. But perhaps the most important thing we need to do is really to engage on um, the problem of the science and to communicate how limited are the opportunities for removals. Let me stop there. I'm gonna find a graphic to that, that, that shows this picture and maybe come back to me later. Thanks. Um, would anybody else, would any of the other pandas like to take this question? Alanita, Tamara, Stephen. What are some of the alternatives that we propose for this? If, um, Tamara, do you want to come in and then? Uh, sure, Stephen, thank you. Um, I think I think that this is a, can you hear me okay? Do I need to put my, okay. I think That's this me. is a question that we've, that we often hear when we talk about the, the problems. And I just want to sort of, situate the, the question and, and what we're talking about a little bit. Um, 
the, the, the main mitigation program that the UNFCCC has to deal with climate change is based on carbon markets and carbon trading. That's what they've got. That's all they've got. And we know that it doesn't work. And so in essence, by trying to expose it and fight against it, we are the alternative here. This, this is it because it is blocking real action to keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And until we can expose and move away from the, this form of marketization and financialization, we're stuck with, we're stuck with something that and in fact, you know, is a program that keeps fossil fuels coming off the ground. Also the fossil fuel corporations and the big polluters make money out of this. They're not doing this for free. They also make money out of these transactions. So, so in essence, by fighting against this, we are trying to create space for, for real action on climate change. And, and in doing that, you know, we, we are doing something um, that's incredibly important. I often get a question of like, so what's your alternative, but said in a way that's that's very much to silence me or silence us. And um, and and I, I find that really problematic. And then the second thing I'll say in terms of like, let's say we break it down and, you know, then what, what do we want, right? So there have been examples of like the Montreal Protocol that dealt with ozone, right? And that was a, a program to phase out O3 that was largely successful um, in many ways. And that's something that I think that we can look at as a case study. Um, and I, I understand climate change is far more complex than that and that there are more greenhouse gases, but, um, but emissions reductions and phasing out fossil fuels at source is, the, is what we want, right? Um, and then finally, I would say that um, it's important for us to look at the amount of subsidies um, that go that go to the fossil fuel industries. You know, these are these are numbers that are estimated in the trillions of dollars of public money that goes to the private corporations. And there are a multitude of studies, scientific studies, all the studies that show that these corporations can only function because of the public subsidies and the, the financing that they receive from governments to function. And so by, by looking at ways to shift those monies that keep the fossil fuel corporations running to other alternatives that are community-based, um, these are some of the, the sort of broader economic strokes discussions. But, but, um, but again, and finally, I, I just wanna point out, and others have said this too, that communities really do have the answers indigenous peoples and, and other impacted communities know exactly how to deal with this. Um, and so it's really a matter of uh, coming together and, and, and supporting those programs, supporting those communities and building greater global solidarity um, across, uh, across the globe. Thank you. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, an, an interesting question. What what would what would be done differently? This is uh, um, this is an interesting question, um, and probably something that uh, that that we, we we should probably think about a, a bit more from time to time. Um, you know, I, I think um, one of the things might be to be um, maybe you know increasing recognition of the UNFCCC for for what it actually is. Um, you know, I, I think I think a lot of people participate in the UNFCCC because they think um, that they're going to um, sort of uh, make a contribution to saving the planet or, or whatever it may be. But um, you know, I think that engagement in a process like the UNFCCC has more to do with damage control um, than than really anything. It's a it's a it's a system that um, has been largely you know, very heavily influenced by the fossil fuel industry. Um, essentially, it's uh, it's built on um, a sort of a, a capital a capitalist ideology around trading. I mean, they've made multiple efforts um, on, on on carbon trading, um, 
and uh, it's essentially a you know a, a, a intergovernmental system that um, has been um, built you know essentially by polluters for polluters and um, and uh, now we see you know just never-ending efforts to try to help the polluting sectors um, you know sort of continue on essentially um, you know another, another thing that's probably worthwhile thinking about is um, you know, I think in the climate movement, and and I don't I don't think that the that the global um, forest coalition is is essentially sort of you know guilty of this. I think the GFC is a really great network in terms of um, the connectivity with indigenous networks and social justice movements and things. But I think that there are some um, sections within the climate movement that um, have uh, perhaps not placed enough emphasis on on the notion of extractivism and um, and addressing capitalism and 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 see, looking at the roots around social justice and racial justice and um, and essentially where um, where where the real roots of these problems um, come from and and so you know thinking more about that that connectivity or intersectionality that um, that uh, that exists out there um, to, to to address some of these issues would probably be. Um, you know, good for for some of the more you know sort of mainstream um, you know organisations um, and, and and networks, uh, for example, the Climate Action Network, perhaps, which I I, I know I do see improvements happening there recently, but um, but uh, but yeah, a, a lot more needs to be done. Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll stop there. I see that Neth has uh, her hand up, so over to you, Neth. Yeah, just just very brief. I I fully agree with what um, Stephen. Um, Tamara and Peter um, said in terms of um, how to do things differently. And I think I just to, to like to emphasize that one way of doing things differently is not to think of techno fixes as the solution to the problems um, that we are in now. I think we are really trapped in the techno fix um, ideology. I would even say that is so dominant in the UNFCCC as um, Steve um, said that um, we have to be very realistic on what we are aiming for in the UNFCCC. And I think apart from damage control, um, another aim that we should have as civil society is to expose what's going on there. There's actually a lot of illusion that is being fed in the media on how things could be changed, or, but very little is said on how things are actually being reinforced um, by forces that are so dominant in the different spaces and corners in the UNFCCC. And in the area of, of geoengineering, um, it's no surprise that many of the geoengineering push, um, technologies that are being pushed are actually funded, are even promoted by the very actors that are behind the problems that we're facing now. Like you have um, Shell and, and cohorts actually supporting um, CCS, really investing on these um, technologies that are actually seen um, to provide an escape latch. Uh, for them. So rather than changing um, the system, they would just offer um, technological fixes that are so attractive and sexy as well for many governments because it's a quick fix. No, it's already there. And then some of these brilliant minds will save us from this problem. And then these billionaires are funding um, many of this. And I, talking about billionaires, I think... Um, eight or nine of the top 10 billionaires um, in this world are actually supporting and funding one way or one or some um, of these um, geoengineering technologies um, that are being promoted um, um, in many spaces. So just to add that. Uh, thank and you Chitra, all. Chitra, yeah. let me come in just very quickly to say that when the IPCC modeled um, future emissions, None of the modeling pathways called for degrowth. The other way to say that, every single modeling pathway considered by the IPCC expected to see continued growth. So we can conclude from this that removals are required if growth is inevitable. So we need to challenge also the growth paradigm because that makes the removal, that contextualizes the removals question a little better. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, that was actually really, 
really helpful to understand because I'm, I'm looking through the chats and uh, I'm seeing variations of the question of uh, on the question of what 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 can we do instead, right? And asked in different ways, and that I feel is a topic for like a whole webinar in and of itself. Maybe that's something that GFC can plan in the future, and we can have all of you back on. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful of time, and I think one of the ways in which we can answer the question of what are some of the alternatives is actually to play this video on what are the real solutions to the climate crisis. Um, we're going to play that for you now. Um, and those of you who need to leave, I understand if you need to leave, but if you can stay, it's a very short video, but it gives, it answers that very question. Um, it's available in English, French, and Spanish. We'll share the links with you, but um, let's watch it now. As shown by the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports on climate change adaptation and mitigation, the world is at a crossroads. We are already seeing the devastating impacts of a 1.1 degree Celsius temperature rise. We are over 420 parts per million of CO2, and we need rapid transformations across all systems to avoid the worst climate impacts. To limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, global greenhouse gas emissions must peak before 2025 and be reduced by 43% by 2030. But current climate pledges and promises made by governments and corporations will not take us to where we need to be. We don't have time for false solutions, such as carbon markets and offsets, net zero pledges, large-scale monoculture tree plantations, bioenergy, technofixes and smart agriculture systems. The most vulnerable groups like indigenous peoples, women and frontline communities continue to feel the increasingly devastating effects of climate change. We must urgently address the intertwined crisis of climate change, deforestation and biodiversity loss. Luckily, the solutions are out there. Many grassroots groups are already implementing gender-just and transformative real climate solutions. They are fighting to secure collective rights to forests, land and water for indigenous peoples, local communities and women. La rentabilisation du mode de vie des peuples autochtones et en particulier les femmes en territoire de Walikali, nous sommes en train de mener une expérience de développement socio-économique en lien avec l'élaboration du plan simple de gestion dans la concession forestière de Sinkafaka à Makassa. Les femmes autochtones sont réunies, sont mises en groupe qui développe différentes activités, notamment les activités d'élevage de, de, de stabilisation des caprés, l'élevage des de, de poules, mais aussi on développe des activités eh, agricoles en lien avec l'alimentation familiale et non extensive. Et dans ce genre d'activités, on met en exergue Women are taking the lead to conserve and protect the biodiversity and ecosystem functions that the communities need to sustain themselves. Au Bénin, en particulier dans la commune de Basila, les femmes rurales pratiquent l'apiculture par des méthodes durables. C'est-à-dire, contrairement à ceux qui font l'usage du feu de brousse, Pour la récolte du miel, elles utilisent du matériel adéquat, notamment l'accoutrement. En plus de cela, ce qui est plus intéressant encore chez ces femmes est qu'elles procèdent au reboisement de leurs forêts ruchées par des espèces de plantes mellifères. Na defesa de seus territórios, da floresta e da biodiversidade, as mulheres se destacam. Elas são as principais guardiões das sementes criolas, elas 
resguardam toda uma biodiversidade, plantas medicinais em seus quintais, raças criolas também de pequenos animais. Então elas têm um papel fundamental na conservação ambiental é, e também no combate às mudanças climáticas. Indigenous peoples, local communities and women are practicing transformative agriculture, like agroecology, one of the most equitable and just ways of addressing our climate crisis. Raman isliye, raman jungle mang kare han, ta raman jungle le ham lathan bamboo. Eha imli dana e, e la aso fer laga, e la aso uplok kar hoy. Ao e chita ke dana e, aso e hula bi plantation mai hula laga bua. Nosotros como mujeres somos las que nos quedamos en nuestras comunidades a cuidar nuestro, nuestro bosque. Estamos haciendo un huerto familiar y también apoyando también al medio ambiente. Eh, en nuestro propio proyecto que estamos haciendo eh, está también reforestar también en lugares donde, donde han sido quemados. Y entonces de esa manera cuidamos la naturaleza. Communities and movements are increasingly mobilizing to fight for their rights and to preserve ecosystems and natural resources. There cannot be real climate action without gender, climate and social justice. And it's not as hard as it sounds. We can do this if we focus on the real solutions that already exist. We wanted to leave you uh, on a note of hope And I hope that video did just that. Um, that brings us to the end of today's session. Unfortunately, I hate to interrupt the incredible discussion that is going on in the chat. I hope everyone has a chance to look through that. Again, a reminder that we will share all the resources with you that was mentioned today and more. So thank you to everyone who made this event possible. Our speakers, Peter Riggs, Tamara Gilbertson, Stephen Leonard, and Anita Dano for your generosity with your time, for sharing your ideas, your knowledge and your thoughts with us. Thank you to our interpreters, of course, our tech support folks, and the rest of the team at GFC for giving us all an opportunity to come together today. Thank you all. Have a good night.